Nina Kinnett. I'm a curator of exhibitions and collections at the Whaling Museum. And so pleased you all came on a nice sunny day. It's very plain of you. Uh, but we have a great lineup of speakers today who come from near and far and uh, to talk about William Bradford. And hopefully you've all had a chance to see the exhibition downstairs in the Waddles Gallery. There are actually two parts to the exhibition. So one is um, Waddles Gallery on the first floor, and those are mostly larger oils and ship portraits, and they just put out an iceberg studies. But there's a separate gallery as well on this floor. It's the smaller Breitmeyer Gallery. Um, we have a sign to that. Okay. So there's a little sign on the way back towards the front desk, the way you came in. To the right, um, by the coffee kitchen, there's a smaller gallery there with lots on paper. And definitely for you to put in as well. We have too many to put in one gallery. Um, so I'm very lucky to have some former curators of past exhibition of Bradford Hall, which we saw in 2012 or 13 on the East region, so it might be the Kitties, one of our speakers on the map. And uh, I'm also talking about the legacy with that, just touch the republication of one of Billy Bradford's books here, um, and then also catalogs for the current shows, so take a look at those in the back of the um, so just quickly, what I'm going to talk about is um, the collection of the New Bedford Museum. So I wasn't here when many of these were brought in. Really, just two of them were here under my, under my purview. But to start off, um, the Whaling Museum has the largest collection of William Bradford's in the world. There are many outstanding private collections and other museums. This is just from Art Encyclopedia, which is a great reference to see brother where artists' works are in the world. So this. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts and the National Gallery, um, we've got the Whaling Museum, Smithsonian Royal Collection in the UK, the Addison Gallery. Um, one of our speakers, Keith Kalkal, actually did an exhibition there recently in Boy Chion, and they have a fabulous collection there. Also, Professor um, Clark Art Institute, uh, Cleveland Museum of Art. So his work is all over the place. It's a national and international um, collection um, uh, of Bradford, but we have by far the largest. So what I'm going to talk about is how our collection got started and when these sort of pulses of acquisitions happen. And we are also looking at Bob Hauser here, who was with the museum for many years, and, uh, and he's welcome to add anything that I forgot. Um, so the first piece that the museum acquired was actually from Mary Bradford. It's a little confusion, Jay Grinnell and I were just discussing this in the hallway. Bradford's wife was Mary, his daughter was also Mary, so that <laughs> makes things a little bit more confusing. But I'm pretty convinced this was actually donated by his daughter, Mary. So this came to the museum in 1909, but so it's been here for over 100 years. And, uh, and this one as well came from Mary Bradford. This is in the exhibition on the first floor on the Wallace Gallery. Um, and this is, just to explain some of the numbers, this is, an, this is a zero, zero number, which means we don't have a lot of information about it. We probably just don't know the year it came in. Um, but Mary Bradford is certainly the person who has donated it to the museum. So it's very nice that the first piece that actually came from his family. Uh, this is his family photo here that Jay just gave me yesterday, so I'm trying to figure out which one is which. So this one, I believe, is his daughter. And this is Bradford that is using there. So with the way these numbers work, so this is what we see when we have a database in our database, but it's also on every label of the museum. And I just thought it might be interesting to explain this if you don't understand what they need. But so the year comes first in our system, and that means the year that the piece came into the collection. The second number is, it's the first piece that came that year, but it was one of a set. So there were others that must have come in as well. So for example, this was the sixth one to come in, but it was probably one of a couple that were donated at the same time. So otherwise it wouldn't have a point one. So this piece was by, um, donated in 1910, and this is one of our biggest treasures, especially on the cover of the catalog for the exhibition. And it's one that really inspired the name of the show, which is in the light. Donated in 1934, little bit is And this is a very interesting story. I was looking for patterns in the database. So Mr. Charles H. Taylor, um, and I have to correct this in our database, I had to call his great-great-grandson last night, <laughs> clarify which Charles H. Taylor, because there were four or five. Um, but Charles H. Taylor Sr. started the Boston Globe. Um, was actually caught, went from 8,000 distribution to 30,000 within the first three weeks that he was running the newspaper. We bought it when it was a weekly paper, turned it into a daily, and, um, and it took off. This was donated by his son, who gave over 50 pieces of Bradford works to the museum. 
And actually, many of them are my, my favorites. Um, there's a whole series of cloud studies downstairs, <laughs> and iceberg studies as well. And they're just very elegant. These were things that were done in plain air. They were oil and paper. Um, and they're just stunning pieces. And even last night when I was driving home, I now have in my head this, um, like some, there's a Bradford sky to me. <laughs> so when you go down and look at the cloud studies, there's some that just, they're so New England, they're just so um, quintessentially beautiful um, for, this, for this area. But you can see here um, that this was the 60, so 1936, this was the 60th set of things that were given in point 24, so this is the 24th piece in that series. But he gave up to, I counted last night, 57, um, the numbering is correct. But he also donated quite a lot of pieces to the PBS Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, so Charles H. Taylor Jr. Um, was, as I said, the son of the founder, founder of the Daily of Boston Globe, who worked there. But he was very embedded in this area for some reason. And still, when I was talking to his great grandson last night, we are trying to figure this out. Um, but anyways, he was a major philanthropist in the arts, and in the 30s, he died in 1941, um, he donated quite a lot of his collection to major institutions, and luckily we were one of them. So while they're not giant oils, I think they're some of Bradford's most exquisite pieces. This one's in a case downstairs, but this is a um, white charcoal and, um, on paper, and there's some wash in some of these images. But they're ones that he did outside as he was out observing, he would bring these pieces back and make his large oil and canvases in the studio. Are those rocks or icebergs? In, I believe this is, I think this is ice in the front and a glacier, <clears throat> um, but it's like broken up ice. The paper would have been white and then the white chalk on it, so that would have been a white on white study with the dark originally. Um, some of the papers he used were grayish, so then you put this white on them, like a white wash mm -hmm. or white charcoal and they really pop out, and he did that with a lot of his glacier studies. We also have a lot of Bradford sketchbooks, and those would be a white paper. I don't think I have pictures, but I'm sure somebody here does, of those. Um, and those, he didn't use colors in his sketchbooks, but he would write warm hue or red or some kind of a brown or something, and he would note those, and then when he went back, he would create the colors from them. Um, and this is another, we're learning so much with this. Um, Mike Dyer, and I just ran downstairs to see <laughs> which William Tripp this was, because there are a few. So in 1960, Bill Tripp gave over 20 drawings of Bradford's to the museum. Um, as far as, unless you found something else out downstairs. Uh, what year did he start? Here? He died in 1959, so I suspect it was his estate or some, some you know, member of the family or something. It's obviously, William H. Tripp is the donor, but, right. but the year is the year after, after he died. So that, that would bear some looking into it. Yeah, so I mean, we've sort of been discovering some new things about this collection as we're going through, but um, he was curator here um, after 1917 and had a, amassed an incredible collection of whaling material, but we just discovered he also donated quite a lot of William Bradford drawings, which I now have to start amassing some kind of a collection <laughs> to bequeath to the museum. Um, but we have a lot of whaling material of his, but no idea that he also had this small art collection. And there's some beautiful drawings. Uh, there, mostly washes and drawings on paper, and uh, many of them are, uh, some of them are on exhibition in the upstairs gallery in the Great Bear. So there were these moments of um, big surges of Bradford. So pretty much everything was donated um, until the 60s when you see a big surge in purchases of the museum. So the museum at that point decided to deliberately start acquiring Bradford's even if it cost us money. And typically when you acquire things as, as a museum, you solicit funds for particular work. We just did this, actually, the library has a beautiful big um, Flemish painting that we have just finished um, fundraising for at that purchase and it took us maybe six months, but now we're allowed, we can buy it, which is wonderful. But typically a director or a curator will look for funds to buy a particular piece. So this was purchased with funds donated by W. Myron Owen in 1968. This is another museum purchase in 1974, and I'm not entirely sure who gave the funds for that. Sometimes you know, it takes a little bit more digging. And then this is a, one of the major purchases. This is Sealer's Question Ice, which is downstairs in the Waddle Scale. It's one of the most phenomenal paintings of Bradford's, um, certainly that I know exists. Um, and the history of this one is quite interesting. Um, it was originally purchased by LeGrand Lockwood for $10,000 to decorate his house. And then when he lost all of his money in 1869, 
in the Panic of 69. It ended up at auction and sold for 8000 which was a major um, price for that auction house. And then it was purchased uh, by Lord Walter Campbell and ended up in England. And that's where the Queen saw it. And she and her daughter commissioned Bradford to paint um, at least one, possibly two, paintings for the Royal Collection. So this piece was purchased during Dick Kugler's time. And as some of you know Dick Kugler, he just passed away um, not very long ago, a year ago. Back. Uh, but he was absolutely instrumental in just pushing forward the Bradford acquisitions for the museum. He was an art historian, he was a scholar, um, and really a world expert on William Bradford. And so he, it was his mission was to make this local artist um, part, of our, part of our biggest um, acquisitions in art. So he pushed a lot of these museum purchases. So this was actually, it was interesting, so I didn't know how much we actually paid for it, and I was getting curious. So, um, so in 1973, um, this is when the final bills were paid, although this was purchased in 72, technically speaking, but it was a little under $10,000. But it was purchased from England and it had to be conserved over there to be shipped back here. Um, and it was purchased through a maritime um, antiquities person in Boston, but it was from England. And then it was conserved heavily again in 2001. And the, the cost of that conservation cost more than the originally, obviously. But now in its current condition, um, it was shown in the 2000 and one Bradford exhibition that um, they put on. And that was a major retrospective of Bradford's work. Uh, this is another museum purchase from 1975. So I didn't list all of the sources of where they were purchased from. But again, this is still during Dick Cooper's period of time in the 70s. So 60s and 70s, um, Dick was really pushing for these books. <coughs> And one of these, uh, Mike, you might know, Bob, you might know, I don't know. Mary Jean was telling, she's our collections committee um, chair and board member. And she was collections manager around this time. She said one piece came in from Betty Googler, and it was in terrible condition, and it was basically pieced together again. But she didn't know which one. Is this the one, Bob? Do you know? I have to take the fifth. <laughs> Anyways, so he would also purchase things that were in terrible shape but that had the possibility of being conserved. We just conserved a couple of pieces that are on display um, in the Bradford show. Um, one was clean, that was, I'll show you the last one actually. And another one that was actually completely, almost ripped in half that we don't exhibit, but it was taken on as a piece to study. So even if something is never gonna be shown because it's too damaged, there's some kind of potential for scholarship that we don't wanna ignore. So we'll take things in and no one will ever see them unless they ask or they're doing research and we tell them it's there. It might be online or something, but they're, we don't purchase them for an exhibition only. Actually, Mike just bought a beautiful ship portrait that's in terrible condition, but it's really important for scholarship. It's a very unique example um, of, a, of this particular ship, so it's necessary to have. Um, but Knowles's were one of the biggest benefactors um, of the museum in terms of donations of local artists. I donated this piece in 1980. This one's on display downstairs. And then this is another museum purchase in 84. So overall, the museum, we have hundreds of, if you look at Bradford in our database, we have hundreds of examples, but it includes sketchbooks, photographs, drawings, etchings. Um, but we have about 40 major oil paintings, which is one of the largest, or it is the largest that I know of. This is a museum purchase in 2000 that I think Dick must have purchased just in time for this exhibition. And then a major acquisition was, of course, the, well, maybe it's not in the course, but the Kendall Whaling Museum came to us in 2001. And actually, Mike was the curator there um, before he came to the Whaling Museum, so he knows about it much more than I. But it was a fabulous collection of national and international works um, regarding whaling. And they had at least four very good Bradford paintings that came to the collection. And this one you can see, is, you can see the size of this particular set of donations. It's 2001, dot 100 is all Kendall, and then this is 4,324. <laughs> and I don't know how many pieces actually came like, all together. I mean, I don't even know they're countable. But half of our scrimshaw collection, many of our paintings, pretty much all of our international paintings, um, and, uh, and a significant library, uh, amongst many other things, came with the Kendall Whaling Museum. But they also had collected from Bradford, and some of our absolute best international works are from that collection, and they considered Bradford worthy to be included in that set. Now this is another candle here. See, now we're up to 7,000. <laughs> 
Um, and then this is interesting. Um, this is a quest of William O. Taylor. I just got all these in Taylor connections in the last uh, week or two. But Bill Taylor then ran the Boston Globe, um, and I think he was must have been the great <coughs> grandson of the first Charles H. Taylor. Um, and he just passed away a few years ago. Uh, and this came to us in 2012. I think he died in 2011. Um, so this is another connection with the same family, but <coughs> quite a bit later. So it's 1936 was the first selection of 60 different pieces and then got to William Taylor in 2012. So Steve Taylor, who lives locally, I don't know if Steve came, I don't think he's here. Um, he also is Starling Burgess's grandson, who's in the Hunt exhibit. <laughs> so I called him yesterday and I said, I found all these things and um, has to be your relative. And he said, oh yeah, of course, I had no idea you had all those Bradfords from my family. And he said, now you have both sides of my family represented, which is very exciting. Um, but anyways, this came to us many years later. I had no idea if Bill Taylor had other Bradfords, but somehow we got this one, which is really very wonderful. It's a nice connection to their family. So when you're doing this kind of research, it's just um, fascinating uh, to find out this provenance history. So I just wanted to show you this too, that when you become the world um, uh, holders of a particular artist, then you start getting things, you get more attention, and you are the, the authority on this particular artist. Bruce and Karen Wilburn donated this sale um, uh, net from uh, Arctic regions, because we already had a copy to an exhibition that Michael will talk about. Um, and we got, what, $100,000, $150,000 for the right sale now. of this book. There's a copy up in the New, New Bedford Free Public Library. We have a copy on display in the Waddles Gallery. So the Wilburns had one, and they said, you already have it, so why don't we sell it, and we'll give you the money. And that funded a fantastic exhibition that um, was already here when I came that Michael curated. Um, but that this is how you know, these collections keep building upon themselves once you get to a certain point. Um, it becomes a natural place for people to donate works by this artist. And I just want to show you this last one is the gift of the Prats. Um, this one actually was secured by our current director, James Russell, and it was given. Actually, was the reason that we have a Bradford show in the first place downstairs. Uh, this came to us um, from the Pratt family who bought it at a, like a, an auction house somewhere in Maine when they were riding their bikes around and it was on the window and they bought it for, you know, whatever. <laughs> And they'd had it for many years, and then uh, Patricia's husband passed away, so she donated this in his memory. And she said, where else would I send it? But to the Whaling Museum, because you guys have the biggest collection of Bradfords, and it should be home with all the rest of them so people can come in and compare. Um, so this is the most recent edition, and it's downstairs in the Waddles Gallery. This was conserved when it came in, and they also funded that conservation effort. So it was the most recent addition to this incredibly large collection. So now we've become the place where Bradford experts, Bradford enthusiasts come. And another major reason for doing this Bradford show, um, and, and Barbara will speak to this, I'm sure. Um, I know you will. Uh, he's one of a really a pretty substantial number of incredible artists that we have from this area. So if you get onto the Shapiro Gallery as well, which is right next to the Waddles Gallery, there's sort of a beautifully um, uh, has a lot of fine decorative arts and glass and all kinds of things. You'll see a selection of artists there who um, were a little bit later, some of them, than Bradford, but uh, we get selections of other fantastic works uh, by people of this region. So not only do we have Bierstadt, who's internationally renowned, we also have Bradford um, and, uh, and Ryder, we talked about last week. So just three major names, we have a, we have a writer as well. He was also a local artist. So anyways, and I'll let my um, partners speak more on that too. But this hopefully gives you a little overview of what we have in this collection. Um, is there any questions? Can you talk about conservation or is that later in the day? No, I can talk about it if you like. Um, I guess and when you're around <coughs> this uh, the varnish goes, mm -hmm. yeah. and I've heard that pink is fugitive. Pink tends to fade and go away, but there's so much lovely paint. And could you comment on what colors might have disappeared just sure. by being hung in the daylight for 75 years or whatever? <coughs> um, what some of the issues were concerned? Sure. Well, the works on paper are certainly the most fragile. And if they weren't given mm -hmm. character, we will. They can rip, they can get brittle, um, they can turn yellow, you know, and foxing and sort of molding and things on those, but they tend to be some of the easier things to fix if you have a really good conservator, which 
um, we have had in Bob, and we certainly have with Jordan, um, who's our game collections manager. Um, but it depends on the stability of the paint. So like an, art, an artist like Ryder would tend to um, use very unstable paints, but also would put varnish and things in between layers and made a big mess of the surface, so it didn't fix very well. Artists like Turner would use a lot of red that was known to be unstable, um, and he and so his reds would fade, but he didn't care because he wanted the instant gratification of this is the color I want, and everyone else began when it's you know when it fades in someone's house, I don't care. Um, but certainly now with synthetic paints, it's changed quite a lot. But reds do tend to fade if the paint's not terribly stable. But um, but Brad, Bradford used good stable. I would say Maybe. in most of his paintings, the colors have been very the stable. Same as it would have been just when he painted it? I doubt it if it's exactly the same. I mean, that would be unlikely, but his works, and many of his pieces have been conserved, so this one has been cleaned. It wasn't overpainted. And sealers, we have a whole, the big one we have downstairs has been relined and it's been cleaned and had tears, and those have been fixed, um, tend to have patches on the back. So when you look at the back of the painting, you can really see its history. Um, but it's really watercolors that are the most unstable. Mm -hmm. So um, any watercolors you see, like, um, or prints with a lot of color, those tend to fade and get damaged most heavily by UV. So you'll see, if you go up to the top floor, we just put up a little more one vintage poster exhibition. And it's a strange place to put a show. It's in a bathroom, a bathroom hallway, but it's uh, but it's all UV protected. It's a beautiful hallway, but it does have bathrooms there. <laughs> but um, it wasn't my first choice, but it's the only place where <coughs> very limited natural light, and regardless, they're all under UV glass, and they won't be up for terribly long. But all those kinds of precautions we take. In the Waddles mm -hmm. Gallery, where these are, there's no natural light. And then we have light meters and things that we make sure that the conditions are stable. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but if we take great care, if we get funding for any show, um, we tend to put quite a, lot, a large percentage of that into conservation of objects before we put them on display. If there are things that you know we have to have last or something, um, like this one, uh, we were able to do some conservation for that, and also a beautiful Bradford drawing that is not on display, but it was <coughs> significant um, for this collection, so we did it anyway. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I'm MC too, so I'm going <laughs> to introduce our next speaker, um, Barbara Moss. And uh, so Barbara and Keith Coppola, who I don't see here, so I hope he's. Um, but Keith and Barbara and I worked very hard together on the Waddles exhibition, on the Bradford exhibition in the Waddles Gallery. Barbara and Keith were both contributors to the exhibition catalog, which is in our light and it's on the back table back there. Um, Barbara's been on the board of the museum for six years, and she and her husband have been an art collector. They have an incredible art collection of local artists um, that really rivals ours. <laughs> and she's a fabulous interior designer and garden designer. And, uh, but her background really is in a lot of cultural pursuits in film and the arts. And she has been an absolute uh, indispensable help to me in my time here because she has this most exquisite eye. And so if you go to the Shapiro Gallery and the Waddles Gallery right next door, um, there's Barbara in there. So she's helped with the colors and the layouts and her knowledge of local artists has just been indispensable um, as I came here from elsewhere. So, um, so I'm gonna introduce Barbara Moss. Please come up and I'll set up your camera for you.